and welcome to The Future is Spoken, produced by the Digital Assistant Academy. This show accompanies the Digital Assistant Academy's course entitled Voice Interaction Design. In today's episode, Brooke Hawkins, a conversation designer, talks about designing for voice in conversational design. Brooke explores how to approach voice design, why this is a great time to enter the field, and what the near future may look like in the world of voice design. Enjoy the episode. Hi, Brooke. Welcome to The Future is Spoken. Hello. It's great to have you here. How are you today? Doing really good. How are you doing? I'm pretty good, thanks. Yeah. And today we're going to talk about designing for voice in conversational design, which is great. I know you're an expert on this subject. Before we jump into this, Brooke, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and how you became a conversational designer. Sure. Um, So, yeah, I I studied at Michigan State University and got a degree, uh, as many people do, uh, in kind of a mix of the humanities. So I was taking classes in psychology and philosophy um, English and professional writing. And ultimately all of that ended up looking like a degree in professional writing, uh, specifically digital and technical writing. Um, and when I got out into the working world, I realized that, you know, I anticipated that I would get a job in user experience design or user experience research. Um, I was very, you know, classically trained in all of the things related to UX research and visual design, uh, but I hadn't really been exposed to the world of voice design. And when I entered the working world, I initially got a job at a company called Emmy, uh, based in Chicago, designing robocalls or IVR calls um, for patients uh, related to their healthcare. Um, so often people think about robocalls and they think, oh, those are the worst things in the world. I know what those are. Mm-hmm. Um, but actually, they're the precursor to all of this really cool and innovative voice technology and smart speaker technology that we see in our homes today. Mm-hmm. Um, so the heads of voice design at Google and Amazon, for example, uh, have been working in these IVR technologies since like the 80s. And after working for that company for a little while, the smart speaker revolution kind of occurred and Google and Amazon both launched their smart speaker devices. And I kind of kept growing my career from there. So I started designing chatbots for different companies um, to kind of manage their customer experience online. Um, all the way to designing voice experiences for for different companies like nonprofits and startups. Um, and now I work for a company based in Toronto called My Planet, and I'm helping them build their voice practice uh, internally to take on more client work around voice, um, everything from e-commerce voice experiences to internal company uh, relationship stuff with with voice. So it's a very expansive universe of voice and conversation, and it's a good time to to be a part of it. Sounds great. So it sounds as though you really enjoy what you're doing as well. I do. Yeah. There, it's kind of like solving puzzles. Uh, I always describe that to people. Uh, there's always just so much going on and, and so many different ways to think about the problems we des- design for when we're designing for voice and conversation. So if you like complex problems, this is a good place to be. Right. That's interesting because um, quite a few people that I've interviewed already in this series uh, for The Future is Spoken. Uh, this part of the series that's specifically focusing on on the new course, which is voice interaction design. Uh, a number of the guests have come from a writing or linguistics background. And yet, as you just mentioned, Brooke, one has to, you know, be quite logical and good at solving problems. So it's an interesting mix of skills. And I know that uh, Becca, Becca Evenhoe, a uh, previous guest, also mentioned that uh, one has to have, you know, an unending curiosity about things and one has to love to learn. So it sounds as though you've got that whole, uh, you know, collection of, of skill set and personality traits to make you a really great fit for this. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I love the way that Rebecca put that. I, I actually, I love her work and talk to her a lot at voice conferences and on Twitter where a lot of us voice people interact. So she put yeah. that very well. Oh, good. So tell us, um, you know, for people who are listening to this and they, they have either a general interest in, in voice, uh, voice design or voice interaction conversational design, or perhaps they're seriously thinking about taking the voice interaction design course at the Digital Assistant Academy. Mm -hmm. 
how would they uh, consider moving into conversational design and what what kind of skills and attributes should they have? Yeah, I definitely always tell people to first start by just digging online. Um, there are some books that have been written about the topic of voice and conversation design. Admittedly, not as many as um, ones that have been written about you know UX research or visual design, but they're being written. Um, so just sort of Google and check out for those. Um, and definitely on Twitter, there's a growing and really large community of voice and conversation designers that are sharing insights about voice and conversation design all the time um, that are a great way to get plugged in and start to understand how people working in the industry are thinking about their work kind of as they're doing it real time. Um, and that's an interesting part about this field. Uh, so much is being decided and made and designed right in the moment. So it's a cool time to join the industry and kind of learn while the people that are already doing this work are learning uh, alongside you. Um, and I would say also just kind of interact with voice experiences and conversational experiences in your day-to-day -day life um, and start to kind of critique them and notice them and pick them apart a little bit. Uh, once you've done that reading and, and start to interact with other voice designers online, I, I think you'll start to notice that you interact with voice and conversational experiences quite a bit in your day-to-day -day life and um, having a keen eye to critique them and then ultimately using those skills of critiquing to build your own skills are a great way to build up your portfolio, to develop your point of view, um, and to showcase to potential employers that you've, you've, you've been thinking about voice design and you have what it takes to, to kind of bring that keen and critiquing eye to, to a company's voice products. Wow, that's fantastic advice. A great, a great range of suggestions there for people who want to check out conversational design and see if it could be a good career fit for them. And, um, I'm just going to digress for a minute because as a podcast host, one always assumes that whoever's listening has listened to previous episodes and that's not always true. So this would probably be a good juncture for you to give us a definition or a description of what is conversational design to you? What does that, those two words, that phrase mean? Definitely. I think I have a pretty broad definition of what conversational design means. Um, to me, it just involves a back and forth between uh, a human and a computer or some kind of digital experience. Um, and while some are with voice and conversation design are more precise to say that that should involve a voice or some written word, I think that increasingly that also includes the visual decisions and the sonic decisions that you make. Um, so even things like the sound of crickets chirping in the background or the image that you play in a smart speaker while you're explaining some aspect of a story. Uh, those are all critical components, I think, of conversational design and help tell an effective story. So uh, to be <laughs> probably vaguer and more confusing than you would think, I, I think conversation design really is uh, interacting with a computer. It's kind of everything. Wow. So any kind, any time that we have an interaction where there's some aspect of voice that could be considered conversational design. I would say so. Um, yeah, I think particularly when you're getting into a space with voice where you're asking for something or there's some kind of inter interchange happening between the human person and the computer, um, there's some design decision that needs to be made. So I, I consider that voice design. Mm. And is that the, still the case even if one's working, say, for a bank and they're uh, designing a telephone menu that might prompt people or ask questions? Does that fall under that umbrella of conversational design as well? Totally. I would definitely say so. Um, for example, everything from the tone of voice you decide to use to represent that assistant on the phone to how long you choose to wait between you know, instructions so that people can effectively hear your message and make a decision um, to the responses that play when someone hits those buttons um, uh, to know that they've hit the right path that they need to go on to get their question answered. Uh, those are all aspects of voice design. Mm, that's fascinating. And it's interesting as well. Re Rebecca said the same thing, and you, you, you've just said in one of your previous answers a few moments ago that it's a really cool time to get into conversational design. I've heard that from a few people. What, why is the time right? What's so cool about it? I think what I find particularly exciting is that it's an industry 
that's kind of shaping as it's growing. So a lot of this technology is new and exciting and we haven't really had something like smart speakers, uh, you know, a little device in your home that can quickly search the internet for answers to any question you can possibly imagine, um, as well as provide you a lot of other services like turning on your lights in your home. No, this is all unprecedented. And so the decisions that people are making right now are, are really uh, important in terms of shaping our relationships, not only with the smart speakers, but um, our relationships with one another. Um, these devices are not you know, novel and only a few people have them. They're in millions of homes across the entire world. So to me, I think it's an interesting time to not only you know, be a part of an innovative piece of technology, which I think any technologist would say is a fun thing to do, um, but also to, to be involved in critical conversations about what the future of this stuff looks like and um, I think my spin on this answer too is that there are a lot of ethical questions and a lot of um, you know humane questions that need to be asked when you're designing this stuff to ensure that you're creating products that are helpful to people and not just disproportionately harming certain types of people. Um, and voice is an, an excellent example of that. So uh, if you if you care about ethics and you care about designing effective products that make people's lives better those questions will come up as a voice designer for you every single minute of the day. Mm. And so I suppose to, to summarize what you just said there, that even though voice has been around for a while now, it's kind of like we're, we're on the edge of like it being a big thing. It's becoming more accepted by uh, people in the Western world, uh, in our cars, in our homes, etc. So it's really about to take off. Yeah. Definitely, I would say so. And I would say as well, kind of the integration of, you know, very intelligent algorithms and data that are able to kind of make decisions on behalf of us, you know, we see these play out across social media, uh, across, you know, ad platforms online, all those same things are happening uh, with voice devices. So they make decisions about when to serve you an advertisement on your smart speaker, or perhaps if you're talking to your car smart speaker, uh, it makes decisions about what kinds of content to play based on your behavior. So again, uh, just like everything happening in technology right now, there, there's just so much interweaving with um, how this stuff is shaping our lives um, because of you know how much they're being accepted in, into people's homes and lives. Um, mm. So yeah. Yeah, and I suppose it's good news, isn't it? Because, you know, before before you and I began this interview, we did touch on how so many people are struggling with currently with the, the pandemic. Uh, and that that's really tough. Lots of people have lost their jobs or been really sick. And this, you know, the development of the academy and the course and in addition, the opportunities in conversational design, they're, they're offering people opportunities and, and hopefully career opportunities. And that can only be a good thing at a time like this. Yeah, definitely. And I would say I'm seeing just from a trend perspective, um, I, I, no one can say how long COVID will last, but we, what we can tell is that it's shaped uh, the way we interact with businesses and e-commerce and, um, you know, even our friends and our families. So, I, yeah, there's definitely a huge opportunity for voice uh, to be assistive and um, fill those gaps or ultimately shape our experiences in different ways than we would have probably used voice when we could do all of this stuff. Um, so yeah, it's a very interesting time to be a part of a technology that is so assistive and um, particularly in this moment, that's a difficult one. Yeah, for sure. Now let's, let's uh, get into designing for voices or voice conversation a little bit more. Um, could you share with us how you approach um, designing for, for voice and, you know, what you might do and perhaps if possible, even give us an example of a project that you might have worked on and, you know, the approach that was taken. Sure. Yeah. So maybe I'll talk about uh, an example of designing something. And I use some of my earliest examples of designing for voice um, in healthcare because I think they are good examples of reaching people and thinking through all the different ways, you know, people need to, to use voice to to, to impact their lives. Um, so for example, when I would design an experience for someone, um, say for example, I'm designing a phone call that needs to remind someone to, to get a preventative healthcare visit um, over the phone. I start the design process and I start every design process by really digging deep into who I'm designing for. Um, so who 
but is going to be impacted by the technology that I'm making? What do I want them to do? What kind of action am I trying to drive them toward? Um, why am I trying to get them to take this action? And and ultimately asking all those questions helps me develop a kind of picture about who I'm actually designing for and, and so I can better address their needs. Then I'll also do that on the, the other side. So once I've kind of identified my target audience, um, just like we do in user experience design or visual design, then you kind of craft a persona or uh, all those kind of visual assets that uh, best speak to the audience that you've just identified. So if you're talking to, for example, patients that need a reminder to get a mammogram um, and they live in Southern Ohio, uh, you might shift the persona of the voice experience you're designing to, to best speak to people from Southern Ohio that need to get a mammogram. Um, you might make certain choices about who is portraying the voice. If you're making a multimodal voice experience, you might make certain choices about what kinds of images to play in your smart speaker or um, visual device to, that speaks to that audience. So maybe images of the hospital in their area or people they might recognize um, from the health institution you're calling or speaking on behalf of. Um, so all that stuff to build affinity and community with the people you're trying to reach. Mm -hmm. Then we get into the actual design decision stuff. So um, what I typically do at this point is, is build a script. Um, so this, I think, is where you're seeing a lot of people in voice design come from script writing or playwriting or creative writing backgrounds. This comes in great handy here. Um, and you kind of just script out what a conversation will look like between your system and the target person you're trying to design for um, in order to have that successful interaction that you aim for. So in the case of trying to get someone to schedule a mammogram, um, you might ask when their last mammogram was or ask um, if they would like to schedule it or when they would like to schedule it. And uh, you design those questions to ultimately get the answer that you want, but you also need to expect all of the different variations of responses that your user might give. So they might say something like, I had my mammogram yesterday or three months ago or 27 days ago or, you know, many variations of a date in the past or a date in the future. Um, and as a voice designer, you need to be able to account for those and, and, and give an appropriate response for each of those types of responses. That's, uh, oh, part I'm the, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, yeah. Uh, I was just going to add that that part of the process, you kind of take that script and then you end up kind of mapping it out and we use flow charting software to kind of show um, based on all those responses, what part of the conversation you should flow to next. Um, and then at that point, you kind of have a conversation that you, you've built and just like you do with visual design and you want to test it, ensure that uh, that conversation is working as you expect. There aren't aspects of the conversation that you may have missed or people are confused by. Um, and then, yeah, measure it and make more changes. It's a constantly evolving cycle of design, testing, and launching. So it, it's quite creative, and it sounds as though there's a lot of um, work up front before you have your end product or end service um, that can kind of go out and be tested, yeah? A lot of research and checking things with people. Exactly, yeah. And it changes depending on the medium. So in that example, I was kind of talking about a healthcare example, but um, your whole frame of mind might change if you're designing, for example, a voice skill in the car for uh, a grocery store. So then you're thinking about someone who's likely shopping for groceries while they're driving on the way to the grocery store to pick it up during their busy day. So uh, yeah, I would say the bulk of the design work goes into those kind of before you even script the conversation decisions, like where are you talking to this person? Why are you trying to get them to do this interaction? Um, yeah, all, all of those tricky questions. Mm. And I, I guess you're looking at it from the perspective of, you know, for the, the person who's receiving the message or the information, it's like you have to kind of position it from what's in it for me point of view. Definitely. If, they, if they're going to... Um, respond and react appropriately yep yeah that's definitely true and you have to anticipate to that note and that's so true um all the different ways that they might not understand what you've just said or interpret it in a different way than what you expected um so that's a whole other can of worms but i mean is 
Is the um, the voice design in a specific example? Is it able to respond to a misunderstanding or a mistake, or does the kind of margin with within which um, you know a program can respond to a mistake or an error? How how wide is that? Um, I would say it's quite wide. So if, when you're designing for smart speakers, there's different types of errors. So for example, if someone is silent, and you've asked a question like. Um, what kind of tomatoes would you like to order from the grocery store? And they say nothing um, that you understand that you received no input. So you can reprompt or design a specific message to, to get the answer that you need to, in order to fulfill that interaction. Um, but you can also distinguish between a type of error where maybe you ask someone what tomatoes they like from the grocery store and you hear uh, something come through, but uh, it it doesn't sound like something you expected, like Roma tomato or heirloom tomato or cherry tomato. You heard pickles or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Then you know that you 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 have enough uh, bandwidth as a designer, uh, based on how these systems work, to be able to parse out. Okay, well, I did hear something. It isn't a response that I thought I was going to hear. I, I'm going to reframe my question and provide a specific error message so that I can help coach someone to, to get the answer that I need to continue through this interaction. So hmm. um, yeah, there, there are ways to segment those types of errors. I see. When, when you're working on designing a conversation like this, we, t- we talked about the amount of work and research up front. Is that, um, is a conversational designer doing that on their own? Are other people involved? What, what does the work environment look like for you in in that kind of situation? Yeah, I would say it's looked a little different every place I've worked. So um, when I worked for um, a healthcare startup, designing those calls, um, sometimes we worked with analytics teams who gave us information about how well our previous calls performed. So we knew how to adjust them or fix them. Uh, We worked with our stakeholders at different healthcare institutions. So they told us information about their patients, um, things about the audiences that we were calling. At different points in my career, I've worked for marketing companies or marketing agencies. Um, And so sometimes I'm working directly with marketing teams who have a lot of very specific data about customers and customer behaviors. So that helps me make decisions about uh, how to design voice experiences. Um, And now um, I I also work with a lot of different types of designers um, and increasingly multimodal experiences. So I'll work with visual designers, conversation designers, um, analytics people, uh, sales support uh, to create multimodal experiences um, that uh, that are kind of touching or interacting with customers at multiple points of the customer journey. Um, so, so there are a lot of opportunities to talk to lots of different teams, and it all totally depends on what type of company you're working at. So many different touch points, and and the you know the work environment can be different depending on where you're working and what kind of setting. Definitely. Yeah. And for you personally, Brooke, what kind of work environment do you like? Mm-hmm. Do you like a more team collaboration or a mix where you're on your own and working with other people? What's what's your preference? I love a collaborative environment. I think that makes the parts that I love about voice design the most fun when you have you know, inputs from a lot of different teams to feed into the work that you're doing. And then you also have a lot of support in terms of measuring and improving the experience over time. Um, so yeah, I love a collaborative environment. I love a team where, you know, a lot of people are invested in making the best possible voice experience. I think that's also increasingly what I think the world of voice and conversation are going to look like, um, especially as we're increasingly talking to voice devices in the home, then in a car, then in our workplace, then at a grocery store, you know, that takes a very collaborative team to ensure that that voice experience is cohesive across all those touch points. So, Mm. um, and what's, what is it that you really like about conversational design? What, what, um, what are some of the things that you really are enjoying about it? Because well, when you look back on your academic uh, career, you probably didn't envision that you'd be working in this kind of field, but now you are and you enjoy it. What are the things that you love? Yeah, you're totally right. I did not imagine that I would be <laughs> in this career. Um, but I would say the biggest thing that I love the most is I, I often tell people that I think voice is kind of the human layer on top of a lot of these complex algorithms and 
uh, you know, data decisions ultimately that computers are making on behalf of us every single day. Um, so as a voice designer, I specifically am interested in how we can use voice and the capacity to use voice to really educate people and help them take control over their data and to, to have more, you know, healthy and positive and humane interactions with computers. Um, I see like a special responsibility of voice to, to be the stewards almost, or like the, the kind of front line of, of a lot of this technology. And, and I think that's a cool responsibility. Mm, that sounds great. Yeah. And it is a, a cool responsibility, just as you described. And when you, when you work on a project and, and it's kind of finally quote unquote finished, is it still a bit of an ongoing creative process in that it can always be modified or, or maybe changed, adjusted, so it can incorporate new feedback or changes? Is that how these conversational design projects work? Yes, definitely. I would say in an ideal situation, that's exactly how they should work. Uh, not That's not always possible. We all uh, know that from our own work. Sometimes you have to get something out the door and it launches and you don't get to see it again. But um, in the ideal world, and I think increasingly so, in, in order to design the best possible experience, you're totally right. Um, having those opportunities to see how your conversational experience is actually impacting people um, looking at data, looking at transcripts, looking at the, you know, the things that people are actually saying to your system and, and then using that data to rework or revamp or add additional features to your voice or conversational technology is so important. Um, and yeah, I think definitely makes your experience better. Wow. And you mentioned looking at, at data and I imagine that's quite important. And even you, you touched on the fact that, you know, you can, you can be working in an environment where there's actually a lot of uh, research to look at even be before you begin a project. So mm -hmm. does someone have to be good with data or statistics to succeed in, in this uh, in this role? Yeah, I would say it's not a specific, like you don't need to understand how to you know, make databases or pull uh, analytics information or create your own algorithms or anything like that. You don't need to be a data scientist. Um, but I would say what is important is to have you know, a curiosity and a keen eye when it comes to unpacking data um, and being able to put a story to the numbers. So, um, for example, you might see that um, with your voice experience that 50% of people are dropping off after the first question that you ask. Um, and having that curiosity to dig into that reason why is really important. So the numbers will give you a hint and it's good to be able to understand them and know what they're saying to you but um i think ultimately it takes that kind of like puzzle mind that we talked about at the beginning to mm. dig in the reason so uh, maybe it's because the prompt is too long and you're talking and talking and talking and people drop off because it's too long or maybe it's a little confusing or maybe there's just a code error that you or you aren't seeing and half of the time people are booted out of your skill or something um, so being able to look at those numbers and and parse out what that story might be is really important yeah so it sounds as though it's not kind of heavy duty um math or statistics but as you touched on again uh curiosity enters the picture in this career and you've got to like see what's happening mm -hmm. and be really curious and uh almost tenacious i would imagine as well definitely so yeah. kind of dig in yeah <laughs> yep it's definitely one of those industries where there aren't a lot of answers out there so again something i kind of mentioned at the beginning this is where your twitter community and uh, building networks with other voice designers comes in handy so you mm -hmm. might get in a situation with design where you don't quite know what to do and that's okay but there might not be a book that provides the perfect answer for you um, so being able to rely on other voice designers and ask those questions is, is super important and, and a fun part of the industry too i think wow and is Twitter one of the main communities that uh, individuals in conversational design turn to, or do you use any forums? You know, I know, for example, Carl Robinson, the host of the Voice Tech podcast, he has uh, a subreddit that uh, people yeah. use. Yeah. Do you I use to, anything else, Brooke? I need to check out that subreddit. That has, okay, sure. But also, there are Slack communities. Um, for example, I'm a member of Women in Voice, um, and that's a they have international oh, yeah. chapters all over the world at this point. Um, 
but they're a great community for other women that are voice designers to kind of chat and share experiences, even post job opportunities within the community, which is really great. Um, and yeah, increasingly, I would say Twitter is, is a big jumping off point, but um, as more and more voice designers are are kind of doing this work, I'm, and especially during this un unprecedented COVID time, I'm seeing a lot of uh, groups like Voice Lunch where people are actually meeting up and doing video calls once a week or several times a week now, I think they're meeting. Um, so yeah, there, there, there are a lot of little communities you can find your way into, but I would say Twitter is a good way to kind of plug into all of those. Yeah, Twitter is a good gateway. Yeah. And Women in Voice, as you mentioned, quite a few people have mentioned that to me, the fact that there are chapters all over. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in, in India, parts of Asia, Australia. So it's really growing quickly, isn't it? It so is. Yeah, I can't remember the year they started, but it hasn't been many years. And yeah, there you used the word tenacious before. Uh, that group is definitely tenacious in the best possible way. So that's a really great community to join. Oh, good. Lots of resources in there, it sounds like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's good. And now I, I know you're, you're not an oracle and you don't have a crystal ball, but what would you say if I ask, you know, what are the next few years going to look like in conversational design and voice technology? Mm, that's a really great question. Um, I think with my particular lens on the ethics and designing humane technology, I think um, the last several years have been about, you know, people adopting voice technology and getting it into their homes via smart speakers and, you know, commercials about voice and having voice in their cars. So I think increasingly we're getting to a place where people kind of know what voice is. It used to be the case that I would say I was a voice designer and people would say, why are you talking about? (laughs) So I think the next few years will be people kind of being more critical and more aware of how these voice experiences are shaping their lives for the better or for the worse. Um, And I think that's a good thing. I think that that's going to mean that people are going to demand a higher quality from the voice experiences they're interacting with. Um, You know, in the early days of smart speakers, and it's still the case, you could ask Alexa to fart or you could (laughs) ask Alexa to do kind of silly things and she would do them, you know, as a novelty. But increasingly, I think people are going to look for more robust and more um, intelligent ways of interacting with voice devices and there are pros to that and there are going to be cons to that. Um, companies are ultimately going to have a lot of data about people in order to do more robust and more tele- intelligent, um, you know, voice stuff. So yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I see it being a more complex time, but a, a, a more uh, innovative time um, because, you know, customers and the designers are going to be expecting more of each other. Right. So they'll become a, a much more uh, useful part of our daily life and the kind of joke questions um, will will probably fade a little bit and we'll start asking more meaningful things or useful things to help us get on with our lives. I would imagine so, yeah. And I'm sure those jokes will still persist, but um, yeah. it'll be like to, uh, making a joke with someone who is embedded in your life, not just a a smart speaker you can turn off and forget about Mm, okay and what what do you think the future holds for you in your career that's an excellent question as well um i definitely as i keep mentioning really care about how voice is affecting all of our lives and and shaping the ways we communicate with each other and just think about the world around us so i'd love to kind of formalize a lot of these things that i talk about um into some kind of book or publication so Uh, I need to do that. (laughs) Um, That would be exciting. (laughs) Yeah. And I love like courses like this and the podcast. I I think it's such an important time for people who are working in the industry to to formalize their knowledge and and make documentation about it because that's what we need. There isn't a ton of it yet. So um, yeah, I'll say that. (laughs) I'll say that's an important goal of mine for the near future. That sounds great. Yeah. And you, you mentioned a lot of the online resources. Do you recommend to listeners any podcasts related to conversational design or books or even magazines that you like to read that sure. might make good resources? Yeah, I, the VUX World podcast is great. Um, that's a great one. Um, I would say VoiceBot is a publication I check in a lot and, and just get updates about stats and, and news about the industry. Um, Bradley Metrock, the coordinator for Project Voice, has a new newsletter about voice. 
um, that he's, I forget the name of it, but I'll, I'll ensure, make sure to send a link to it after um, we talk today. Sure, um, we can put it in the show notes. But he's a great resource as well. Um, and then I also read a lot about just like tech and AI in general. So Karen Howe at uh, MIT Technology Review has a really great newsletter that I really recommend people check out. Um, and there are a lot of great scholars at MIT Media Lab right now doing a lot of great work around ethics and AI and data justice. Um, so I would check out the groups, uh, uh, the students that in the groups that study at MIT Media Lab and specifically the Algorithmic Justice League. Um, that's a project of one of the students at MIT Media Lab. That's a great one to, to check out. That's that's fantastic. Thanks for all those. We appreciate it. And, and as you mentioned, we'll... We'll gather the links and the references and put them in the show notes for listeners. No problem. Yeah, I'm excited. Excited to view the rest of these as well. Good. Is there anything else that you'd like to touch on or mention be before we sign off today, Brooke? Um, no, I don't think so. Other than to just um, be confident. If, if you're listening to this and you're excited about voice design and don't quite know where to start, um, I, my biggest advice to you is just to start. Um, so you don't have to know exactly what you're doing, but just bring a curiosity, be confident, ask as many people as you can questions, um, and know that if you have a curiosity about voice, you, you can gain the skills that you need to be a voice designer. It, um, so just do it. <laughs> Good. Yeah, we're quoting another company's logo, but we'll say it again. Just do yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. well, tag, tag I line, didn't I even realize. Yes. <laughs> no, that's cool. It works for a reason, yeah. <laughs> yes, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Brooke. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Yes, thank you so much. I appreciate being on. And yeah, like I said, I'm excited to watch the rest of these. Good. Uh, we actually re released a show today. Um, it was Rebecca's show, oh, Path cool. Pathways. Yeah. Yes, I'm so excited. Pathways into conversational design. So uh, you can find that on your your favorite podcast app or um, on the website digitalassistant.academy. So I'll mention that for listeners as well. Great. Take care, and I'm sure we'll speak again soon. Sounds good. Thank you. You too. Thanks for listening today. Remember, you can find all the information on how to become a certified voice interaction designer, along with show notes and more, at our website, digitalassistant.academy. That's digitalassistant.academy. We encourage your feedback and questions, so be sure to get in touch by using the contact page at the Digital Assistant Academy's website. We'll include the link in the show notes. In our next episode, we will dig further into the voice design world by exploring the power of voice design with Dr. Joan Palmiter-Bajorek. Mm -hmm.